What I want to do in this clip is to give us just a potted history, a, a short overview history of how music has developed within the church. And as I've said before, in terms of, of the church year and in, church, in terms of what we use the church space for, that space has changed in the same way that the music has changed and the way in which we use music within the church service. As we begin the church environment, as we begin the history of the Christian church, we see that the early Christians met within synagogues. So they were still part of their Jewish cultural frame. Now in the Jewish system, there were instruments, there were uh, the concepts of singing psalms. But we see that in the early church, to a large degree, there was a rejection of instruments, both by the Jewish people because it connected too closely to some of the things that had happened in the temple, and by the non-Jews, the Gentiles who came into the Christian church, rejected instruments to some degree as well because it reminded them too much of the pagan worship that they had come out of. And so what we see is that in the first few centuries of the early church, the music would have been a cappella. It would have been without instrument. The only instrument being the voice. And basically they would have continued to sing psalms. The psalms, the 150 psalms that we have within the Tanakh would have continued to be the, the, the hymn book for, for the Bible and for the early church. But once the church begins to, to come out of the shadows after Constantine, and once they start building these big basilicas, obviously things begin to change. That it moves from that simple, connected way of singing psalms into singing something more, into, into kind of developing new musical developments and new musical understandings. As we saw in the last clip, one of the things that develops is the concept of chant, um, is the concept of, of harmonized singing. Now, all those concepts of singing actually begin to take on a new life for the church. The church begins to develop music that's directed particularly at this new development of music that happens within both the Middle Ages and then particularly into the Renaissance. Uh, at that, the, the turn of the first millennium, things change drastically in the way music is done. And of course, the move then is away from the singing of the congregation and the participation of the congregation and now begins to be focused on the professionals. And so it becomes much more professional process. The choristers, the people in the choirs and the cantors have special training to be able to read music, enable to be able to harmonize. And so it moves away from the ability of the congregation to participate. So worship moves from being participatory and connected into something which becomes now more spectator based. That the people in the congregation are spectators in the sense that they don't participate in the singing, even though what they are is participating in the act of worship, which then is able to draw them into the mystery that the music is meant to provide. And so it's at this point that we end up with an interesting situation. If you look at the, the, the way in which churches are structured, you end up with on one at the far end, you've got the table, the, the altar, and then in between the altar and the congregation, you end up with the choir. So that instead of the choir being relegated to the back of the church, in fact, the choir begins to take a central role within the whole process, the whole creativity of worship. Is that the choir, and often the choir sits opposite each other because of the type of music that was there. It's called antiphonal singing, where in fact one side would then be responded to by the other. Now you can imagine that as a member of that congregation, you would be just immersed by the song, by the wondrous singing that would envelop you. Because again, that was furthering the process of what the basilicas were for. The basilicas were there to actually focus people on the mystery that was happening on the table in communion. And the music then would help to foster that sense of mystery, that sense of awe and of wonder. Most of the music was written in Latin in order that, in fact, people might have, even because they wouldn't understand what was being sung, but have that sense of the otherness of what was taking place. This goes through to the Reformation. But, of course, the Reformers come and bring in a whole new way of thinking about this process. Because now, instead of saying that somehow people should be separated from the concept of worship in terms of participation, or at least personal participation, what the reformers say, no, we need to draw people into the participation 
of the worship itself. And so here we reintroduce people back into singing. We've got Martin Luther writing, uh, writing songs, writing hymns, which would be sung within the Lutheran community. But when we look at Calvin, for example, we see a whole different view. For Calvin, he believes that we need to go back to what they did in the early church. We need to go back to singing just psalms, no instruments. So he banned the instruments and go back to the singing the psalms. And of course, that gets taken back to Scotland by John Knox. And what we see is the development then in the Presbyterian church and later the free Presbyterians. No music, no hymns, no non-biblical stuff. And so again, music moves into a place of music becoming just the filler, just the, the, the thing that leads up to the preaching and the exposition of the word. Of course, that changes again with the Methodist revival. That in the Methodist revival, uh, as I've said already earlier in another clip, uh, you see Charles Wesley coming forward saying, no, we can use music as a vehicle. In fact, Charles Wesley goes so far as to say that music is the one gift of heaven that we're able to experience and enjoy here on earth. And so he uses music as a way to further his framework of church, to draw in these coal miners, to draw in the, the bottom of the, of the barrel in terms of, of uh, the, the society and make them excited by what Christianity can do. And so music plays an integral role in the Methodist service, often singing hymns by eminent Methodists like Isaac Watts or like Charles himself. Once we move into the, the 20th century, we have another revolution, and that revolution is the Pentecostal Revolution, or the Charismatic Revival. And what that brings is something completely different again, because now the focus is on the work of the Holy Spirit, and on the emotions and the feelings that music generates. And so here we move away from the hymns, which sang in a very clear meter, into something now which is short and, and energetic and enthusiastic and often accompanied by the rise of some of the new instruments that were happening during the 20th century. And so what we see is that where the church in the first 12,000 12, years or 1,200 years was actually the kind of setting the standard for music, by the 20th century, the church now begins to learn its musical connections from the secular world. It draws in pop music and it draws in rock music and jazz music into the process of the church. And so we move away from, from just having hymns or a particular liturgical way of understanding uh, the songs and the music to now actually reflecting some of the society in which we live. That what we do is we draw in the music from outside and we make it into Christian music. In fact, at the moment, there would be almost every form of music that would exist in the secular world now would have a Christian counterpart, much of which is used within the church service. And so you can see that as we go through the history of, of the church music, how church music has evolved and developed depending on what was happening outside it. That music becomes the vehicle for what we're trying to achieve in worship. 